Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum, featuring timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. Today, ISF CEO Steve Durbin and I discuss research he's been conducting since the fall of 2021 around the New World Order and the race for tech dominance. This is the second of two episodes focusing on those themes, so if you missed the first one, you might want to pause this and go back, listen to last week's episode, catch up on the good news there, come back to talk about the race for tech dominance. Steve, tell us who's competing in this race. Who are the players? Well, the main protagonists, uh, you know, there are no surprises. They're the big tech companies. There are the cyber criminals, nation states, and in particular, which is very unusual for me, because I don't tend to sort of pull out individual countries and things, but I think I do have to in this instance. It is the United States and it is China. Hmm. Okay, so last time we spoke about what cyber criminals are up to, the CEO cyber criminals, phishing, theft, data manipulation, data destruction, Network intrusions for theft of IP, compromise of data. Is that a pretty good overview? Yeah. I mean, you've probably forgotten some, but... Um, but <laughs> <laughs> In that list of all the good news, as I said. No, that, that pretty much covers it. All right. Well, let's then talk today about big tech companies. Tell us what your research has revealed about big tech. Well, again, we're back to our good old friend COVID. You know, the COVID lockdowns really accelerated the digital physical hybridization enabled by the fourth industrial revolution. So it's probably worth people just pausing and thinking, where would we have been during the pandemic if we hadn't had technology? How might we have Mm. coped? You know, almost overnight, businesses worldwide just faced the need to strengthen their digital presence to survive uh, and adapt. And we saw that across all industries, even the most heavily regulated, which for some I think was surprising because this big push and requirement for compliance really became secondary to just pure access. And we did see, I think, as I said last time, you know, years of digital transformation being implemented within weeks. Mm. So what's that got to do with the tech giants? Well, for the tech giants, of course, that was a major opportunity. Demand grew rapidly for services ranging from e-commerce and remote working technologies to online gaming and streaming. You know, people were just bored at home. And in early January last year, 2021, the world's five biggest tech companies represented 23% of the S&P 500 by market cap. That was a almost a 5% increase from late January 2020, so over the space of 12 months. Hmm. And you know, as other sectors struggle, I'm thinking in particular of retail here, the big tech players are likely to emerge from the pandemic with stronger, more diverse revenue streams and certainly enhanced investment power. So barriers to entry in the digital marketplace are likely to increase at an even faster pace. Even before the pandemic, you know, the amount of computing power for a leading AI system was doubling every two months, so an increase of 300,000 times since 2012. And all of that, of course, has implications for smaller firms too. It flows down in the form of things like higher costs, control of critical data, digital infrastructure, and even to financial stability for emerging and developing markets. So, you know, looking forward, looking a bit more positively, the recovery, which we're starting to see, is also going to give fresh impetus to large tech companies through acquisition of startups. Hmm. as well as their expansion into other sectors, such as retail, healthcare, transportation, and indeed logistics. I do think that as we emerge from the pandemic, we are going to see very much more of a boom across a whole range of different industries. And of course, we do have some very, very cash-rich organizations that are out there. We've started to see merger and acquisition activity increasing. We've started to see private equity getting back into a number of different markets, plenty of money there. It's relatively cheap as well. Interest rates continue to be low. And so I think we're going to see some fairly rapid changes in the overall global corporate landscape. And I do think that big tech is going to be one of the winners from that. Hmm. What about nation states? What have you learned there? Uh, Nation states, again, is an interesting one. Talking to people at Interpol, the FBI, we're all seeing cyber attacks from nation states rising at a somewhat alarming pace. Not just let's take something down 
So not just that ransomware, you know, attack that we saw towards the back end of last year, you know, Colonial Pipeline, for instance, or JBS, the meat processor, those sorts of things, but much more insidious for me. And some of the things that you and I have talked about that worry me more. So misinformation, Mm -hmm. manipulation of data, targeted strikes, very, very targeted strikes. We've seen an increase in phishing and whaling going after, you know, big targets. Cyber attacks and resource grabs as well, you know, they're also on the rise. But it's this sort of more educated cyber attack, if I could put it that way. And the pandemic as well has really shown that governments, it's really shown how they can wield conspiracy theories as geopolitical weapons by making accusations about other states. And I think that unfortunately, the next decade, you know, is likely to see more frequent and impactful dissemination of disinformation on issues of geopolitical importance, such as elections. We talked about that quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Humanitarian crises, do they exist or don't they? Public health, we've seen a lot of that through the pandemic, you know, with different views being attributed to vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, and so on. And of course, the traditional security and cultural issues. And I think that states and indeed non-state actors alike, you know, are likely to engage in more sophisticated cyber attacks targeted strikes we're going to see the use of drones we're going to see the use of other technologies that's all going to become more ubiquitous too and i I think i talked about some of that again in the emerging threats for 2022 podcasts that i did at the back end of last year and also of course we cover a lot of these things in our um, threat horizon report which will be out for members anyway around about oh in the next couple of days Uh, Other people who aren't members will have to wait a little bit longer than that. But, Mm -hmm. you know, some of these things are issues that we'll be talking about very much more there, too. Mm. Let's talk about your fairly unusual move, as you said, to single out the U.S. and China, which I don't know that I have heard you too often be as pointed as that. But why are you willing to call out those two countries? I think what we've seen is something of a shift. An intensification, if you like, of US-China competition, perhaps some would say more aggressive use of subversive tools of geopolitical influence, and indeed a growing nationalism. Uh, And they're all fueling the shift from what I would describe as being rules-based, where everyone, to a certain extent, played by the rules of the game, to very much more a Mm power-based global order. So it's really this growing competition that's at the root of all of this. So growing competition between the United States and China, you know, isn't just confined to those two regions. It could also hinder other regional powers that might otherwise wish to continue to pursue a balancing strategy. I'm thinking in particular of the Middle East. So Middle Eastern governments, for instance, could be you know, thrust into something of a tug of war with renewed U.S. diplomacy efforts being juxtaposed against increased Chinese economic initiatives in the region. If we go to Latin America or Africa, you know, China's deepening economic ties could potentially rival historic security-based alliances and certainly cultural connections with the United States. And one of the things that we've seen fairly recently is new. So if you look at Africa as an example, some of the very large infrastructure projects there, telecoms as an example, you know, are Chinese funded. And yet a lot of the services that are being provided, that are being bought, are US-centric. So within an organization, you have this little microcosm of what's going on. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that if you are a large-scale provider, then you're attractive from a cyber attack or a cyber espionage standpoint to both sides. So the problem has become exacerbated. And really, you know, it's all down to these two different large world powers, as I say, moving away from this sort of rules-based to power-based approach. Coming out of the pandemic, you know, China is projected to overtake the US as the world's largest economy Hmm. sooner than we'd previously predicted. And that's one of the things behind this. So the competition between the US and China is more intense than it's ever been? Is that a fair assessment? I I would say so. I would say so. And I think that, and some people may find this strange, but you know, research and evidence do show that this escalating technological competition between the two largest superpowers has actually had a negative effect on the global economy. So US companies are the leading providers of foreign direct investment for technology in something like 130 odd countries globally, including countries that are considered traditionally to be China's allies, Russia, Argentina, Pakistan. So although countries may be diplomatically close to China, in terms of technology, 
they're economically tied to the US. What does that mean? Well, it means that China is now trying to create a technological block by exporting standards through cross-border agreements. So an example of this is through the Belt and Road Initiative, which was launched in 2013. And that's primarily an infrastructure project it's aimed at linking more than 60 countries from Asia, Africa, and Europe in a very complex network of roads, rails, and ports, but more recently has been expanded to include technology. Now, to counter that initiative, the G7 met to align on their approach in combating China's economic, technological, and military rise. Now, one output of that meeting was what was termed Build Back Better World, B3W. This initiative proposes a transparent partnership and funding for developing nations to help close the $40 trillion infrastructure gap and provide an alternative to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Now, while Build Back Better World cannot compete with certain elements of the Belt and Road Initiative, such as lower costs or looser standards and faster timelines, it does propose to place more emphasis on improving global welfare, sustainable development, and multilateralism. So with the US and China both engaging in initiatives, such as you know, Build Back Better World, Belt and Road Initiative, it's becoming clear that both superpowers really do intend to increase the reliance of other countries on their respective systems, in particular when it comes to infrastructure and, of course, technology. And these initiatives will build on existing alliances with allies and may be the early stages of a formation of two fully-fledged independent global systems that extend beyond just the technology market. So there is a tremendous amount of discussion ongoing at the moment, particularly around the internet, as to whether or not that will be broken up, whether it's already broken up to a certain extent. What does that level of fragmentation mean, not just from a security standpoint, but also from a business perspective? Hmm. The current trajectory of the way that that US-China dynamic is moving would seem to indicate that developing common rules to govern technology is unlikely. And so while China has continued its technological rise with the intention of becoming a world leader, as long as the two governments in Beijing and Washington are at odds, attempting to harmonize that technological competition really seem to be a little bit hamstrung. So that is the context for the way in which we have to now go about doing business. We have moved, if you think about just technology, we've moved a number of years back to really looking for expanding supply chains, low cost production. That moved significantly into the Far East, China in, in, in particular. If you look at some of the world's leading organizations, Apple, for instance, has been manufacturing in China for a very, very long time. But it, as I say, it was a rules-based environment. Mm -hmm. The need to expand the recognition that technology is going to power the fourth industrial revolution and therefore is going to have a direct link to jobs and economic success has changed that dynamic. And so whilst I don't think that we're at the end state yet, we are going through that process of, in the case of the two larger superpowers, feeling each other out and laying down some of the beginnings of the way in which the world will evolve and develop. And what's that got to do with you and I? Well, you could say not a lot. But if you happen to be a multinational, if you happen to have supply chains that are extended across the world, then you are going to be impacted in some way, shape or form by some of the things we've just been talking about. And so, again, it's something else that we have to throw into that overall mix when we look at how we're going to secure our data and how we're going to transact business effectively in 2022 and beyond. Do you have hope for positive, constructive outcomes? Do you feel like this is bleak, bad news? Is it a mix? What's what's your crystal ball show you the future holding in 2022 and, and well beyond? I think it's change. I think it's change. And I, I have Steve, I don't like change. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, <laughs> you know, I, I happen to be somebody who does. So for oh, me, <laughs> for, for me, things are looking good. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but but there is a significant amount of change that that brings about. And the thing about change is that you very often don't know how it's going to end up. So it's going to create opportunity along the way. There's no question about that. You know, in a world where constant connectivity, real-time processing is vital to doing business, you know, even brief periods of downtime have severe 
consequences. So the issues we've been talking about around cybercrime, for instance, are relevant. During a period of change, they could come to the forefront even more. So yes, I think that strategically speaking, boards, companies all around the world need to be considering some of these things in their go-to-market thinking, because it is going to change the way in which we operate. But as I said, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. We are going to see, I think, new technologies continuing, I would say, to invade every element of things that we do. And so it is about us understanding where those technologies are being made, where the data is being stored how it's being used. Are we opting in? Are we opting out? Those are the sorts of things that I think are going to require us as individuals to change. As for the bigger stuff, then for a lot of people, you know, it's going to be simply a question of adaptation rather than anything else, I think. Well, I will try my best to adapt. I'm being facetious. I do like change, but I do think that the speed at which things are changing is ramping up. You and I have discussed before our love of pen and paper. Mm -hmm. And now we are, well, we may prefer that. Millions of, uh, what was it? Extra bytes? I don't think that was the, Zeta bytes. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's the world, Zeta bytes. And I remember my first iPod that had, what, 128 gigs. And I thought that was massive. So there's a lot to keep up with. And I'm glad that you are always here to educate us and lead us through. It's helpful and helps me deal with the amount of change. There is a lot of change. And I suppose, you know, we should just pause and think about the impact of all of that as well on regulation, because that isn't something that we've talked about hugely on these two podcasts. But regulation, you know, when I talked about a move from rules-based to power-based, that has an impact on regulation. You know, new regulations, international agreements, they're not going to be able to fully address the issues that are powered by advances in technology and the way in which that technology is being used. So I think that we will see regulatory tit-for-tat battles across nation states. It will be more complicated. You know, if you're a multinational looking to expand into different geographies, you're already having to spend a lot more time with your legal people understanding that regulatory landscape. And so the fear is that rather than encourage innovation, it you know, stifles or constrains new developments. It certainly pushes up costs. There's no two ways about that and increases the complexity of trade for multinational businesses. And, you know, at a time, I think, when we're trying to globally emerge from a pandemic, you know, that is just one of the things that we all have to bear in mind, because I do think that the regulatory landscape is going to become very much more complicated over the next, I would say, 12 to 24 months. And it is something that, you know, we're all, I think, as business leaders, going to have to spend a little bit more time on to make sure that we are delivering the return on investment that we'd originally imagined from uh, some of our expansion plans. Hmm. You know, our conversations are often um, a little grim, but one thing that I really appreciate is that you're going to solve all of these things. (laughs) Right? That's that's why you have the silver bullet, right? Yeah, that's right. That's why the ISF exists. We're... we're, we're, um... (laughs) But no, I mean, you know, joking aside, we do, of course, try to shine a bit of a light on some of the challenges that are out there, try to anticipate, try to look forward a few years, try to come up with potential solutions, different ways of working that our members can take advantage of to really, I think, deal with some of the sorts of movements and changes that we've just been talking about. And none of them are going to go away. So I think the world is going to become an increasingly you know, complex place. And that does mean, I think, that the challenge that we face as an organization, as the ISF, is going to increase and I'd like to think is going to become ever more interesting. So it's certainly something I think that a lot of our people, our analysts in particular, relish, you know, trying to grapple with some of these things and how they can work with members to solve some of those challenges. So at that level, yes, I hope we are around to solve all these things we've just been talking about. And I hope that our members, you know, continue to work with us in the way that they do on solving some of these things. Well, as your podcast producer, it always leaves us plenty of subject matter to discuss. We never run out of (laughs) podcast episode ideas, so my needs are met. (laughs) Thank you, Steve, for the uh, conversation over the last couple of weeks, and we'll be back for more throughout the year. We'll be back next week with another episode, and in the meantime... If you would consider writing a short review of the ISF podcast, we would be very grateful. 
I ask for this every week, but I do always mean it so sincerely. Reviews are a big support in helping new listeners discover our program, so thank you in advance. If there's a topic or a question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, we'd love to hear from you at securityforum.org. And while you're there, we invite you to explore our catalog of past video and podcast episodes, as well as ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. Find us on LinkedIn by searching CEO Steve Durbin or Security Forum. Follow our audio feed wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. The ISF podcast is produced by Talkbox Productions and Tavia Gilbert, with music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer Katie Flood, mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.